All right, hello everyone. Um, thank you so much for coming. Um, looks like we have a pretty small group, so um, you know, feel free to jump in. And um, I think I think you, I got introduced earlier. So, um, <laughs> but once again, I'm Una Daly from the Community College Consortium for OER. In case you missed uh, the earlier session. Um, the keynote and I work with community colleges around the country. Been really excited to have Front Range um, as a member of CCCOER for like the last, I'm going to say three years. And I've worked with Gene Runyon, Dr. Gene Runyon, for over a decade now on open. And so just thrilled to be invited to be here and to talk with you about equity minded course design. So um, I um, I direct the Community College Consortium for OER, as I mentioned. Um, in the past, I did some instructional design, particularly around accessibility. It's been a few years now since I've done that work. I was also a part-time faculty for a number of years um, at Foothill Community College. My background is computer science and math. So um, <laughs> for what that's worth, anyway. So today I want to talk to you about universal design for learning and, um, and equity um, and how OER enabled pedagogy uh, can really be married together with these principles um, to, um, to help with student success. And um, so here are the topics I'm going to cover today. And um, let me just bring up my chat window and I, you know, really encourage you to either chat or, uh, you know, um, jump in and there'll be certain areas where I'll, I'll ask for your work. I, I'm going to assume um, most of you are faculty. Would that be correct? No. Okay. So somebody's, uh, so uh, tell me about yourself. <laughs> you can do that in the chat window or you can jump on the mic. I'm an adjunct with mathematics, yeah, instructor. Okay, great, great. So uh, other faculty, okay, yeah, um, ESL, English, okay, uh, part-time. I'm not sure what MGD is. You're going to have to spell that one out for me. Manufacturing and graphic design. Oh, okay, great. Oh, biology. Oh, wow, early childhood education. Oh, that's wonderful. We have a, um, just a... Wonderful. Great. Great. Uh, it's good to see that wide sense of discipline. Um, I, there's a biology instructor in California um, who I um, uh, um, just enjoy her work so much. And she works around equity minded uh, instruction in biology. And she's um, done many presentations with, with us, which are recorded. Um, and I'd love to introduce you all to her at some point. Uh, her name is Susan, Suzanne Wakeem, or with Joaquim. Uh, she's at Butte College in California. So for you biology folks, I'd uh, love to share some of Suzanne's stuff with you at some point. Um, she, she, and her, uh, she and her students create a textbook together uh, over, over the semester. And then they, they re, she reuses that material the next semester with, the, with her new students. And they get to see what last semester students did. And they move on from there. So really exciting. Um, so I'm going to jump into um, what equity is, equity and universal design for learning. You know what? What's the overlap? What's you know what's the synergy there? And then um, I'm going to talk about um, open pedagogy, um, which I think in the description of this was called OER enabled pedagogy. But it's what is what are those combinations of that open license, open content, and open practices? that we can combine um, to um, empower our students, particularly students, um, marginalized students, non-traditional students. And uh, I hope you'll jump in and help me with this. So the term equity mindedness, this is from the Center for Urban Education at the University of Southern California. They do some really exciting work in this area. They're not necessarily open, but their practices are about expanding access. So the term refers to the perspective and thinking exhibited by practitioners who call attention to patterns of inequity in student outcomes. And these practitioners are willing to take both personal and institutional responsibility for the success of their students and critically reassess their own practices. So 
this is a process of learning. Uh, nobody is nobody is there yet, and um, equity is an ever evolving area, and um, we help each other out as we move forward to improve um, outcomes for our students. Um, there's an excellent book that just came out, and I've I've only been able to read the first part of this, uh, but this is from um, the, but it, it's by Dr. Andra Tesha Fritzgerald. Um, and she is part of CAST, which is the organization, the nonprofit organization that came up with the original Universal Design for Learning. And she's just published a textbook called Anti-Racism and Universal Design for Learning. And what she says is we start with honoring the student. That, that is the key to this. And when we design with every student in, in front of us in mind, that is truly Universal Design for Learning. And that provides, you know, true freedom in the classroom for all. And she focuses on both K through 12 and higher ed. So let's look at who our students are. This is from AACC, the American Association of Community Colleges. So this is a, an amalgamation across the country. So the average age is 28 years old. Um, the median age is 24, if, if that matters to you. Um, most students are working. Uh, while enrolled full time. 20% um, of our students report some kind of a disability. Um, we, most of our institutions are now what would be called minority majority institutions, which is a really kind of silly term that doesn't really mean much. But what it means is over 50% of our students would, would report themselves as non-white, as another race besides white, um, or possibly multiple races. Um, first generation, almost 30% female, uh, uh, majority female, so uh, slightly over 50% female at, um, as an amalgamation. Um, so let me see, yeah, so, so that's who our students are, a very, very diverse group. So um, designing for all of them is, is challenging, but um, we, we traditionally know that there are certain achievement areas where we really need to address these students. Um, and one of the areas is disabilities. And so this actually, these statistics are disabilities um, for undergraduate students in general, not specifically for community colleges. Um, although I 50% of undergraduate students with disabilities attend community colleges. So more students attend community colleges, those with disabilities, than any, than any public four-year or private four-year. And you can see that there's quite a range here of learning disabilities, um, ADHD, psychological, chronic health and mobility. These are the um, uh, categories that the National Center for Education Statistics uses. So any questions about those statistics, where they come from? Okay, and I, I'm trying to monitor the chat, but um, Nicholas, if I miss stuff in the chat, please do jump in. Um, Cause sometimes I have a hard time <laughs> speaking and reading the chat at the same time. So universal design for learning, how many of you are familiar with this concept? And if you, if you don't mind like putting in the chat, yes, no, or let me see, I don't have the participant window open. I could ask you to tell me in the chat. Okay, so okay, so if some of you are um, somewhat, okay. And we're not gonna dive in in a really deep way on this, but we're gonna go over the general principles of what the universal design for learning is. And um, since I at least four people said they were familiar with it, um, I'm gonna ask you know if there's uh, things you wanna jump in with, please do. Um, so, you know, it really starts with there's no um, average or typical student. Um, every student brings their own unique qualities. Um, and this slide is actually from my good friend, the biology instructor, instructor uh, Suzanne Wait Joaquin uh, out of Northern California. And it's built around three principles. One is around providing multiple means of representation. So giving students information in multiple formats. Um, obviously text, uh, but video, audio, uh, there may be other ways of giving students information, but look to make sure that your instructional uh, 
delivery involves as many ways as you possibly can to support um, students. Uh, we used to use the term learning styles. It's a little out of date now, but to support uh, students. And of course, it's very important that those materials are accessible. So those students who might be using screen readers or have other disabilities can participate fully. Now, the second one is providing multiple means of action and expression, and that's uh, for students. That's really how do students demonstrate their learning and providing multiple ways for students to do that beyond the multiple choice test, beyond the essay. What are other ways that students could demonstrate their learning and really bring their own talents to, pl to play in this? And I, I wanna ask since, um, we have people who are familiar with it. And how many, and I'd love to hear examples of what people have done in their classrooms. Would anyone like to share <clears throat> ways that they've worked with their students either to provide multiple means of representation or multiple means of um, demonstrating their learning? have my students build their own quizzes using Bloom's Taxonomy, but they have the choice of what types of questions they choose. But by them kind of, I say it's quizzes, but it's more reading reflections that are formatted, but mm -hmm. them getting to choose if they want to share a video that relates to it or an additional article or even a meme or drawing that relates to it. Um, I think all of those just giving them multiple options of ways of expression that, that they understand the material is something that I do. I love that. Um, and, um, and I'm not sure who was speaking. Was that Jessica or? I no. Yeah, Jessica, sorry. Jessica. Yeah, and Jessica, what do you teach? Communication. Communications, okay, wonderful. Wonderful, I love mm. that. Thank you. And I bet your students do too. <laughs> Um, in, in the chat, Iris is um, using video feedback to other students and video presentations. I would assume that's an um, opposite to maybe a paper turn in or a, a different representation. Wonderful. Yeah, thank you, Nicholas. And thank you, Iris, for sharing that. And um, Katerina also mentions that she does a lot of video feedback too. Um, hmm, okay. I, you know, and what I hear from instructors who provide video feedback is it, they feel it's such, it's so much richer um, because we do communicate a lot with our faces. Um, and even though sometimes we have to say, you know, uh, we have to say, we have to say that there's improvement needed, but I think, um, you know, sometimes that can, be, that can come off as very harsh when it's written. Um, but, uh, you know, a video, and, and obviously it depends somewhat on the instructor, uh, how comfortable they feel doing that, but um, it can be really, the message can be far more powerful. Yeah, Una, and the, the feedback, the video feedback is not just instructor to student, but also like in their peer reviews, they're using video feedback in that way as well. Okay. To each other. Wonderful. And Iris, what do you teach? Writing. Writing, oh, okay. Yeah. And that's, that's super important to have peer feedback. Um, wonderful. All right, and finally, the last principle is providing multiple means of engagement. So tapping into learners' interests, um, challenging them, um, and motivating them to learn. And, and you know, for those of you who were at the keynote earlier, James talked about um, bringing in those stories that have been hidden um, around history of perhaps their cultural background, uh, could be a gender thing if you have uh, women in STEM who many times those stories have been lost. And so bringing in that to motivate students and show them that it's possible for them to also succeed. So back to what an open educational resource is, I just wanted to remind people that it could be, it can be digital or it could be a hard copy. Uh, these teaching, learning and research materials, they can be in the public domain or openly licensed. Um, and the reason I bring up public domain is because um, almost all of our uh, federal government uh, resources that are created um, are openly licensed. I'm sorry, they're public domain. Um, it, there's a now a requirement if you get a competitive grant from the Department of Ed that you openly license your materials, which we mentioned at the, but so, um, you know, um, for instance, the Department of Education, the Department of Energy, uh, 
a lot of our different departments at the federal level have these wonderful resources they create. Sometimes they're instructional materials, sometimes they're simply inf information materials for consumers and um, citizens, you know, just for everyone, essentially. Uh, those are public domain. And so you can add those in, um, you know, at will into your courses and, and, you know, make copies. And so it's really important. They're wonderful resources. So I want to make sure people know that. Um, and, and then there is that free access online, uh, free to use, free to adapt and um, redistribute with your students. And, uh, you know, it means that you can give your students access to these online resources on the first day of class. Um, we're all teaching online now. So uh, that often, I know instructors often reach out before the first day of class and provide that link to students as well. Um, generally, these materials have low cost print options too for those students who wanna take advantage of that. And finally, once again, faculty can adapt for students and their course needs, and you can invite your students. Um, to adapt work as well, if that makes sense in your class. So what do faculty tell us about the, you know, the advantages of this? Um, since they're not using expensive textbooks, they say, well, I just eliminate those chapters that um, I, I'm not using, uh, that the course doesn't require, um, and that I, in the past, I had students read it simply because um, I felt they were spending so much money, they should use the entire book. Uh, once again, somebody brought up earlier uh, at the keynote, um, publishers are in business, and so they will change versions often every few years, um, and it may be a very small change, but it eliminates the used bookstore, uh, sorry, the used book market, uh, and therefore students have to pay full price again, and so that's... Um, that's something that OER can get around. Um, you can, once again, you can customize those for your learning objectives um, and you can ensure accessibility of materials. Now, I realize that this can be challenging often for faculty, but um, this is something that I'm sure Front Range provides um, assistance with some instructional design to help you um, with the accessibility of your materials. Um, because that is, it, it is key that as we're expanding access uh, around cost, we are not taking away access for those of, for our students with disabilities. Yeah, th thank you for sharing that, Iris. Um, and and so usually, Iris, I'm going to assume that you have the right to choose your own materials. Um, some some departments have kind of a standard that they use. And so then you, um, sometimes it's a kind of a negotiation around that. But when you get support from your higher level administration, uh, from your, uh, your department of higher ed to support OER, it makes those, I wouldn't say negotiations, but those, those conversations easier. All right. Uh, okay. And Stacy says that she doesn't have the right to um, choose her own textbook. So I, Thank you for sharing that, Stacey. I wonder what field you work in, uh, if you wouldn't mind saying what your discipline was. Um, and mathematics. Okay. Yeah, thank you for that, um, Stacey. Um, and I know that um, sometimes there's some in the STEM areas, I know that sometimes it can be a challenge to move to open, uh, particularly with requirements around online homework systems. Um, and wanting to provide some consistency for students as well. So yeah, thank you, Laura, for saying that adjuncts generally don't have those choices. So um, hopefully over time, um, this becomes um, less, of, less of a challenge that as we have more support for faculty. And, and we know it's extra work for faculty to move to open educational resources in the short term. And we, we have some statistics on that, which I, I won't go into now, but there's been some research done around that, that the first time you teach with OER, yes, there is a huge increase in time, but subsequently um, th th that amount of time goes down considerably. So, um, but yes. So I wanna talk about this, uh, open pedagogy and what I refer to as OER enabled pedagogy. So it, it started really with the cost of textbooks and that led to these open educational resources because the internet was created, you know, I don't know, it was probably 40 years ago, but it really became an important part of education about 20 years ago. And so all these materials were 
freely available, but they were copyrighted and you could be sued if you were, <laughs> you know, using those without purchasing them. So it was really about access to knowledge. And, um, and many faculty were starting to create their own materials. Um, and, and what, what really became obvious is we need to ask students about what they need as well and involve them in, if not the creation, certainly the curation of materials. And that really is what open pedagogy is about. And you can see how the universal design for um, learning principles are very married to this idea of providing students with choices and asking students what they need. So once again, the five permissions of OER, for those who aren't familiar, it's about being able to revise that open resource, remix it with other materials, reuse it, redistribute it, and then keep a copy forever. Because, you know, early on, a lot of faculty will ask, I mean, they, they will say, well, you know, I'm using that textbook on the OpenStax site. It's a, OpenStax is the, is the biggest open textbook publisher currently and they have about almost 40 textbooks up there for you know the first two years of college and um i say to them you can actually download that upload it to your lms and keep it that is that is an open license you can retain that um obviously the 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 version that's on open stacks is wonderful because they have the web version which you can click through for links and they can do searches um but those materials are available for you to keep um and for free so um, do, you know, do take advantage of that if that's a worry for you. So this is about being learner centered, centered, right? That's what the equity is all about. What do our students need? And um, I thought maybe we would talk about the syllabus because um, every course has one. And, um, you know, it's often thought of as a contract, right? That's the traditional model. Um, I'm, you know, you as the student are responsible for this, reading this, you know, taking this quiz, taking that test, um, you know, producing this homework assignment. And I, as the instructor, um, you know, am providing, you know, lectures and etc. cetera. Um, but that can be um, intimidating for students, particularly students who might be coming back in. Um, they're often extremely long, <laughs> those syllabuses. Um, so check that language. Is it inviting or punitive? You know, uh, is it all about if you don't turn that in, you know, um, by such and such, you know, uh, that's 10% off or, you know, or you're going to fail the class. Um, so it really reveals your attitudes and beliefs around um, student learning. And we know that our students are working. Uh, they have lives. Many of them have um, families, uh, family commitments that they need to address as well. And um, so flexibility is key. Um, and so looking for um, partnership with your students. Um, and also we talked about instructional materials earlier. Um, do your instructional materials reflect your students? Um, if you have pictures in your, uh, your syllabus, um, do, they, do they look like the students in your class or are they more of the traditional uh, images? And I know that it can be hard to find openly licensed images, um, less so now, but uh, a few years ago, very hard to find diverse images. Um, so I wonder if anyone else has, has looked at their syllabus through this kind of lens. And uh, it, you, feel, free to, feel free to unmic yourself and... and um, I have found it's interesting at um, Front Range, we have been given a bigger and bigger template now um, that a lot of what the syllabus is, is not our language. Um, I would say at this point, 70%, I don't know if people would want to give a better number for that, is dictated language to us. Mm -hmm. um, that it's like, just include this, this is the official language that the college wants you to use. And so um, you really only have like that 30% margin to have like your voice on like what your class looks like. And so I have found like my welcome message within my syllabus has become much more important. Like that's kind of my first chance to say like in this 15 page document that I'm asking you to read, um, like this is the part that's like really my voice. 
Um, but I've also done a lot more where I get my students to um, look at course outcomes and tell me um, we do like a red, green, yellow um, chart out of it of like, do I feel confident in this idea already? Do I not even know what this term is? And like, what is rhetoric? Um, and that to me has really helped answer that question. Like what do students need on the first day and turn part of my syllabus that I feel like is just official language into something that can be more student centered. That's so wonderful. It doesn't, it doesn't make the syllabus shorter but you can always add to what's there. Um, mm -hmm. we, have rebe we have rebelled a little bit and reorganized a tiny bit from what's supposed to be there but we have a whole page on equity, classroom community, um, resources and supports that are available that isn't in our normal syllabus, but a whole lot. Um, we actually added a statement on, yes, we recognize that the frame of science is, has been from the white male perspective and we are trying to break free of that. Please let us know when you notice we failed. So you can add a lot in. It does yeah. keep, ours is 15 pages, so <laughs> it keeps it long. Thank you, Kaylee and, and Laura for sharing those great ideas. Um, yeah. Oh, sorry. <laughs> and I, uh, speaking of adding things, I added the student student learning outcomes to the end of my syllabus as well, and used the icons to show students where I was um, addressing those within the assignments and different things that I do in class. Mm -hmm. Lovely. Yeah. Other other thoughts? Yeah, it's unfortunate, but, but I just feel that you know, by the time we have a 15 page document, anyway, we try to approach it and get them to read it. Um, it, it takes creativity in the first place, but there's a, there are whole chunks that quite honestly, I tell them you can skip over because they're just state requirements and they don't lead to any improvement of their understanding what our class is gonna be about. Great, yeah. I think there was someone else who wanted to say something. Yeah, um, I, I, um, Iris kind of hit on it. I have, uh, when I have the space, and I think in the chat, Liliana brought a good point that I believe a lot of the templatized language is to meet um, accreditation, HLC kind of guidelines and, and that kind of nature. But um, when I've had the ability, I've reframed it into as many of those pieces and parts you can reframe into like what you can expect of me, what and what... Um, uh, a student, your student experience is going to be like, and what kind of, you know, reframe some of the policies and, you know, I will respond to things. And um, that seems to be more student centric, um, though I refrain from changing the current front range syllabus and place all of that in my modules. I think someone else mentioned um, we have more freedom when it comes to modules and modifying that getting started here. Uh, I have lots of images and like, this is how your week could work if you want to meet all the deadlines and things of that nature in the getting started. Um, mm -hmm. So, I've released any notion of my syllabus being read by my students, honestly. Um, I just, it's there for covering my butt and covering the department's butt and the college's butt and that everything is all taken care of. And especially since COVID, the, the students just use the um, D2L online modules, um, uh, the weekly modules that I create, and that's all that they really follow. So nobody even, if I missed a screwed up on a page number or something, nobody even notices if it was actually on the syllabus. It's only on the modules that they, they care at all. So, Okay. Thanks for that, Amy. Um, yes, I, I hear you. Um, you know, um, this particular, these set of questions I've been asking and uh, is from the Center for Urban Education at uh, USC, once again, uh, their equity tools. And they actually have one uh, for um, creating your syllabus and they, they take you through it. Um, might be of interest to some folks. Um, you know, and I've seen other people who have kind of like the college syllabus and, and their syllabus. Um, and technically, you probably can't call that a syllabus, what you do. Um, and, um, and, and there's also an open pedagogy notebook. Um, I, I, there's a, she's a Russian professor. She teaches contemporary Russia who has done co-creation with her students of, of syllabuses, syllabi. And I think she's at a university rather than a community college. 
Um, but yes, her students actually create uh, what are their expectations of the instructor as well. So, I, you know, I think it has to be um, kind of, it goes both ways. Um, and um, so I, I think I, I gave you a link in the resources page to that. Um, and, uh, you know, many instructors add videos. Um, you know, I think it was Amy was talking about in her modules. Um, sometimes, um, so they'll have like an intro video for the week, um, which covers kind of what would be in the syllabus, uh, you know, for that week, what would be specified in that chart that often lives in our, um, our syllabi. So thank you all for sharing. It sounds like you guys are doing some really great work. Now, this is a great example. This is from Joe Brankert. He teaches at Front Range, and I'm sorry, I don't know which campus. He presented with us on our Decolonizing the Course uh, webinar back in September of last fall. And he has actually had some of the training from the, from the Q Center, the Center for Urban Education. And so he said, he takes his, syllab his syllabi, and I, I hope this hasn't changed <laughs> since September, but um, he has an introductory um, section. What's this class about? You know, real short. And then a picture that shows, a, you know, a diverse student body, um, how to reach me, you know, what, what are the expectations, and then what we will be doing. So he tries to make this really clear, friendly, inviting, um, and all the basic course information, you know, upfront in his um, syllabi. And it sounds like many of you are doing that already, but um, I, I think this is a wonderful example from a math uh, professor. Uh, he also talks about scheduling of the assignments and being as flexible as he can, uh, giving them the options upfront about how they're evaluated. So I think, um, and it was, um, that's recorded if you, if you want to listen to it. He had some other wonderful ideas that weren't directly related to his syllabi uh, for making his classrooms more equitable. Um, and so, as I mentioned in the open pedagogy notebook, I, I won't go into that right now because we're actually um, only have 15 minutes left, but um, the invitation from this Russian uh, contemporary Russian uh, professor was, she asked her students, what do you want to learn from the course? And I think one of you mentioned what they, what she finds out when she asks that question is she finds out how, what level of knowledge they're bringing into the course. So it's very useful from that perspective. Uh, and then they set up class agreements and objectives, which are different than the course objectives, uh, but they are honored in the same way. So um, when we talk about open pedagogy, OER enabled pedagogy, we usually talk about renewable assignments. So these are moving beyond, um, you know, that that essay that you've had your students write uh, for, you know, for the last 10 years, um, <laughs> first semester essay, you look at it uh, and grade it and then it's tossed. And it, it sounds like many, you know, I, I heard Iris, she says she has a lot of peer review that's going on, but there may be some opportunities uh, for your students to, do, to have some choice around what those essays or, um, or you know, research articles are written about and for them um, to get feedback maybe uh, even beyond the classroom, maybe with some experts in the field and actually to publish them. So um, in the sense that um, they could have a open license on them and they could make those available uh, maybe through your institution. Um, so really making them meaningful. These are assignments that students could actually use in a job seeking situation to show um, what they've done besides just you know, showing them showing transcripts or something. Um, they could actually show this is something I created in this class and it's openly licensed. So it could be on a, on a website if they so chose. There's a, there's a college in Maryland and this is kind of spreading um, to other colleges. There's another one in Arizona that's doing this. Um, Laura's sharing some fun stuff here too um, on about a scavenger hunt. Um, so this particular one, um, it, it the instructor is there in the top uh, right. It's uh, Dr. Amy uh, Caratini. She's an anthropology professor. And um, she, in her intro to sociocultural anthropology, her students are able to conduct a fieldwork project um, where they study um, a field of their choosing. Uh, her student 
Ava last spring chose to do theater because she was very active in theater, uh, both in high school and community. And um, as her output from that was a video which has now been shared widely. And Eva has now moved on to, into an independent study project. Um, and Eva, this quote here is from Eva. It's quite long, I'm not gonna read the whole thing. It says, we use the open education textbook perspectives in my anthropology class and I'm still using it, she said, because I, you know, I still have the digital um, copy of it. And in addition to using the, fin the final benefit of using a free text, the financial benefit, I'm sorry, of using a free text, it's easy accessibility made study and learning the material far easier as they, I was able to view it wherever I was physically. So she could take that with her. Um, and so this is about um, you know, creating our students as um, contributors. Um, and um, helping them to find their, their niche. Uh, where are they gonna go um, as, um, as learners and as, um, you know, as successful citizens uh, moving beyond their, um, their college experience. So, um, and, and, and there's many more examples of this as well, but I wanted to, since I am running a little low on time here, um, and I just wanted to, uh, this is my final topic. <laughs> Sorry, I'm checking my time here. Um, so those of you who use Zoom know you can't see the time on your computer <laughs> when you've got your screen shared. This is a picture of um, eyeballs, essentially. And, um, if you ask your students to go out and look for eyes or some image on Google, you're likely to get um, a picture that looks a little like this. And I, I wonder what folks think about this particular picture. Any, any comments about it? Any thoughts about what's being returned? Majority uh, light skinned. Yeah. A lot of, yep. Yeah, blue eyes, uh, far more than um, the um, population. population. And, and in fact, may not look, certainly probably not representative of the students in your class. And that is, that is another, you know, typical inequity uh, situation. And so to the extent that we can engage our students, um, we need to move away from these freely available um, materials. And, uh, and in fact, um, until very recently, I would say in the last few years, this there was a heightened awareness about this. If you went to some of the OER repositories to get images, they would be very similar. In fact, they might be less diverse. That has changed, fortunately, uh, in the last few years. And here's a set of resources. Um, I also I've linked to an article that has a longer um, set of resources uh, as well. Um, so that you can um, put re put pictures and images into your modules, into your uh, syllabi, into your slides, if you still do slides, um, that really uh, look like your students and really invite your students to be part of the part of the discussion. Um, Flickr is also a large repository with um, CC BY images. We had to kind of rely on that in the past, and this is simply just. Um, another example of using um, images that, that look more like your students. Um, it, and that open license allows you to make those, those changes um, and to use those openly licensed um, images. Generally, if you, if you just search with Google, um, you'll need to turn on advanced search in order to specify that you're looking for open images. Otherwise, you will receive copyrighted images, which technically you, you're not um, able to use. Wonderful. Thank you for sharing that, Jean, um, that you, you put in images of women. And, and I know in career technical ed areas, they've, there's been a big switch, fortunately, now to have those posters that invite, you know, your students in to look at, uh, let's say, doing construction work or uh, doing um, uh, other apprenticeship type programs and having a picture of a, of a woman uh, on there, um, you know, women or young women, uh, rather than all men. Uh, the computer field is, is very similar as well. Um, great. Oh, thank you, Nicholas, for sharing that. And so um, in addition, um, 
it, the, the open license allows you to customize for regional um, orientation. And so on the right hand side here, I have a water technology te textbook from California. Well, Southern California has a lot less water than uh, Colorado is, um, in, is particularly in, in that Denver area. Uh, you get a lot of water, and a lot of snow. And so you might take an open textbooks from California that's on water technology. Some of the principles, of course, will be the same, but you'll update those case studies to be representative of Colorado. Um, and students can contribute and curate. And this particular textbook on the right-hand side, that um, image uh, was found by students and given to the faculty member um, as an openly licensed image that they could use. So College of the Canyons, which is James's college, James, our, our keynoter, um, uh, has a student team that works with faculty, helps faculty curate materials that will be incorporated into the textbook. And that's really all I had. That's a good thing too. And I just wanna, I wanna hear more about what's happening um, in your classes. So please. I will oh. speak a little bit. Um, my name is Noelle Vincent and I teach interior architecture and design. And um, I'm finding that um, I have a lot of public I publish my work as well as I'm a practitioner and I can't use my own work that has been professionally photographed because it's not owned by me. It's owned by the photographer. And there's not a lot of interior design images. So I'm just wondering, um, you know, I'm creating them. So I'm using my own photography with my iPhone to take pictures of things so I can include them in my OER uh, platform. But when I'm interviewing students, uh, former students who want to be a part of this, do we just need to make sure that they sign like a model release just so we have it on record that, you know, they participated and other people around the planet might be watching a video? Well, they are adults, correct? Yeah, but uh, yes, I would, I would make sure that, yeah, you're, if they're videos, I would, I would ask them to sign an agreement. Um, and if you want it to be openly licensed, um, actually this question just came up on our email list um, it, it, within the last few days. And um, so Noel, if you contact me, I will send you the link. Um, it is from a OER um, practitioner in Oregon. And she has a set of resources for faculty who want to work with students. And so she has an agreement that they sign and. Um, but it's really important to let students know what these open licenses are, you know, and to be and to explain that. And so she has a set of materials for explaining that to students and then inviting them to um, participate. That would be great. So, uh, Thank you. Yeah, I'd love to share that with you. So just um, email me. And um, and there was a question there was from uh, Rachel and. Um, yeah, I apologize, Rachel, we didn't go over the Creative Commons um, licensing. So Creative Commons licensing is the open licensing that allows all that uh, work to be done, all that revision and uh, revising and, re and redistribution. And the CC BY is Creative Commons attribution. That is the, that is the most um, shareable license or what we sometimes call the least restrictive. And it means that if you use somebody's resource that has the CC BY on it, uh, you simply, and you're going to redistribute it, you simply have to give them credit. So you have to identify the, the portion that you got from them and simply put in an, um, a, a credit uh, that uh, this portion was um, uh, adapted or, or it might be just completely put in. I mean, if you don't do an ad adaptation, but that's all, that's what that means. And there are <clears throat> there are four very popular licenses. Um, the other ones to be aware of are you can put an, a, a non-commercial license on uh, one if you would prefer that your materials uh, and sometimes creators prefer that it's not allowed to be used in a commercial environment. It, obviously, education would not apply to that. So it could be freely used, even if it says non-commercial. Um, there is also... Um, um, the other one to be aware of is share alike. So if you redistribute something that you create by using other people's resources and your own, um, you need to share it alike with the same license as the materials that they that they released under. Um, and that Wikipedia does does that. They use a um, 
they use the share alike um, on their site. Um, all right, and I'm, I'm trying, sorry, I'm trying to answer the questions here. What about releases for their own pictures or text with credit pictures? Yes, there's, you know, Laura, I would talk with um, your librarian. Um, there are different ways of doing that licensing with students, um, particularly if you're going to do like a collection of stories from students. Uh, your librarian would be the best one to talk to. I think Molly would be, um, because there's a training that many librarians have started taking, which is the Creative Commons licensing training. It's, I think it's like a 10 week course that librarians take and it helps them. Um, they're really the experts on this. So I, I'm sorry, I, I, there are answers to it, but I, in this short period of time, I wouldn't be able to go into the details on that. Um, Do you have yeah. to license material in general? Like, can you post it on a public forum and just say, anyone who wants to use it can use it? Or does it have to have a license each time? Um, well, it depends. So is this your work that you're speaking about? Yeah, like if I make something, like if I make a project, and I'm like, you know, I really like this project. I want to share it. And I put the uh, directions and rubrics up for anyone to use. Um, if you've, so, and you want to make it an OER, then you do have to put a license on it. If you don't, you don't, obviously you're not required. You could put it on a public site um, without a license. That would mean that it was copyrighted. So anyone who reused it would have to come to you. If you used materials from other people as well as yours, you would have to give their you would have to give them credit for what you received from them. Um, so you would have to put a license on that. And generally, I mean, I, it sounds like you would be licensing it. Um, if it, if it's entirely your work, there is no requirement for you to openly license it. Um, but then people can't share it freely. It would they would have to come to you um, because it would be copyrighted. That's the default. When you don't specify, it means it's copyrighted. And Rachel asked about what about using student work in, in future class material. So it's important to talk with your students and ask them um, what license would be appropriate for your materials. And some students might say, no, I don't want my materials to be reused. Um, and so we need to honor that. I think many students would like the idea of having their materials reused and would be willing to select one of the Creative Commons licenses um, for that. And so I, it's, it's really a discussion. And so um, once again, uh, I'm happy I, to share the, the, some I've of that. i problems or questions regarding that, Rachel. Mm -hmm. um, and I was told it was going to be a FERPA violation if I use their material and show it to other people. Now it, it, it was submitted work that was ended up graded. Um, and so you have to get specific permission from the students. You can't, yes. like, even if you love it, if they say no, or yeah. if you don't ask them, then you can't use it. Well, yeah. That's, that, yeah, Stacy, that's absolutely true. I think it was Stacy who was speaking. You yeah. do need to get permission from the student. Yes, absolutely. And you should get it, uh, it should be a signed form. Mm -hmm. I had trouble getting students to sign it though. And I even gave them a yes or no option. I was like, just take this survey and say yes or no. And mm -hmm. I still was only able to get less than, in between like a third and a half of my class to take the survey. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I know they need to be motivated in some way and I'm not <laughs> suggesting financial motivations at all. Um, I'm just saying they need to understand the importance and maybe and how that might be a value to them in the future. If you're going to publish this, uh, maybe that's something they could put on their resume um, when they're looking for a job and that that might motivate more students. Um, but you know once again it is it is their choice. So yeah great. Thank you for, for fueling those questions, Una. And thank you all for being in this session. I, I wanna make sure we respect everyone's time as it's 11 a.m. But thank you so much, Una. Please give her a round of applause. Sorry, not applause, but applause. Um, and thank you so much for your time thank, today. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Nicholas. And thank you all for sharing, uh, you know, the work you're doing, the questions you have. Um, I know that your students are in good hands. And I'll be sharing this slide deck with, um, I, I, probably with Molly, um, and so that you will have all those links to those different resources um, 
that you can go to and investigate further. Thank you so much. Thank you. Have a wonderful rest of your day.